Hi everyone, my name is Winifred Lewis. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Queensland, um, a social psychologist, and I've been at UQ since 2001. And I grew up in Toronto and Montreal, from Canada, as you can hear from my accent. Paul? Uh, yes, associate professor Paul Harnett um, in the School of Criminology at Griffith University these days. I was um, trained in New Zealand as a clinical psychologist, moved to Australia and um, worked at uh, the University of Queensland in the clinical program there from 2003. Valerie? Valerie Stone. I was a neuroscientist, uh, came from, you can hear my North American accent too, came from the United States to Australia uh, to join the School of Psychology there and uh, we came with an interest, even though it wasn't explicitly part of my academic research work. Yeah. And we're talking today about the establishment of the School of Psychology Reconciliation Action Plan, which um, we think might have been 2008. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it actually preceded the University of Queensland Reconciliation Action Plan and was in the context of what non Australians might not know is a sort of broad movement to try and make reconciliation part of the institutional agenda of um, uh, universities, of corporations of the country. And so the idea would be that a corporation or a university would make a commitment to further reconciliation between settler society and First Nations peoples, and that they would establish concrete KPIs, that they would say, we don't have the right support for students, we need more staff, and that they would try and make that a part of their actual professional and institutional commitments. And so, um, Paul, when you developed this idea, it was really novel. How did you come up with the plan that we would have a plan? Um, well, I'd heard about reconciliation action plans and I didn't really know that much about them, um, but I thought, um, it could be a very tangible thing to put it on the agenda that uh, you know to, to raise the whole issue of uh, first nations issues and the need for it um the need was to teach the non-indigenous students um more about first nations issues but right. um we're also very aware of the lack of first nation students enrolling in psychology um and thought, you know, is that because it's culturally unsafe, culturally irrelevant? Um, what what were the reasons for that? But, uh, you know, we needed to, part of the development of the Reconciliation Action Plan was to do a survey of the staff. Um, so the first thing, you know, in, in the process of developing it was to actually just send a, um, a survey around to all the staff to find out what they were actually teaching if anything. Um, and the results of that really came back that there wasn't anything much happening. Um, not just that it wasn't happening, but there was a fear of actually um, introducing it because um, there's this, you know, this Australian, kind of white Australian kind of fear that you're going to make some kind of cultural breach. and you know, do something wrong, it's best avoided. So there was actually a fear of um, introducing First Nations issues into courses. Um, so that was not a culturally safe environment for First Nations students. So part of the motivation of the Reconciliation Action Plan um, to put it on the agenda was to try and um, uh, increase the confidence of non-Indigenous staff to um to be able to address those issues and make it a more culturally safe environment and try and attract more first nation students we had a clinic one of our first clinical psychology students um told me that she enrolled at uq because we had a reconciliation action plan yeah i mean it was a full signal and i think it's kind of what i wanted us to talk about today i mean i you, I think, had already um, been involved a couple of years earlier in developing that workshop that Paul was also leading and that we just talked about in another video. But 
Um, the institution, I think it's fair to say, had a lot of mixed feelings about um, reconciliation and making it concrete and part of our professional agenda. Um, some people were really open to it, and I think we had the support of our head of school, without which it could not have been adopted. I guess we can. Uh, I know Debbie Cherry was certainly um, supportive. Yeah, that's um, right. I think she, she was the she dean at that time. The dean at that point, and um, it could have been Christina. Christine. Christina Lee, Lee, Lee yes, yeah. 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 Um. So, so that was important, and at the same time, there were other people that were kind of like, well we're not going to engage very closely. I think probably um, it had the most power as a symbol. When I think of actual change within the school, I'm not sure that it pushed our school to do more than it was already doing. Maybe it badged and credentialed what we were doing and sent that signal. Is that what you think, Paul? Um, I mean, to be honest, uh, I updated it. Um, I think it was a about 2012 or something around yeah. there um and after that i chose not to um because i felt that there was a little bit of crowing going on around we've got a reconciliation action plan and there was just but there actually wasn't any action um, yeah. there wasn't sufficient action one of the um simple recommendations um for which we gave staff a lot of guidance was to do an acknowledgement of country at the beginning of a course and the first lecture and, and try and encourage um, tutors to uh, acknowledge you know the country and traditional owners um, at the beginning of the uh, of semester um, and that didn't happen it was, yeah, it, it, you know, it only happened two years ago in 2021 mm. It became official mm. school policy two years ago. I mean, I think that's that's really a conversation that that I want the listeners to hear. That when you start something like this, it really feels useless. Um, mm. but Ten years from now, you may see the change that you advocated for and hope that you were part of that change. It might have happened without us, but you know, UQ eventually adopted us a reconciliation action plan as well, um, and that was quite a few years later, you said, Paul, you didn't think that um, that the university was inspired by us, but that other schools had approached you. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there was, um, it, it was interesting um, in that there were individuals and in other schools who, like myself, were sort of um, wanting to introduce First Nation content into their, into their uh, curriculum uh, and attract more First Nation students. And we would sort of find each other and meet for coffee. And, you know, so um, uh, and I what what came out of that was the difficulty that other schools had uh, well, staff within other schools to um, follow and develop a reconciliation action plan. Um, so, um, yeah, um, it was, there was resistance in other schools as well. Um, and it was really interesting to be able to hear about that. It was partly about a failure to recognize the worth of indigenous knowledge. Um, at least that's my perspective. And I think we all have had this experience that People were kind of like, we can't collaborate with and take on board Indigenous knowledge because that's unscientific. Mm. <laughs> I know you've had quite a bit to do with that, that issue, Valerie. Do you want to just mention in this context that struggle, persistent struggle? <laughs> it, it's a worldwide struggle. I mean, this is true throughout the globe. Um, I, since that work also continued to um, participate in something called the Indigenous Science Network, uh, which is based in Australia. Um, and I'm, I'm actually recently volunteered about with their newsletter, searching down news stories and about anything we can find anywhere in the globe that's some initiative that blends, you know, brings science, Western science, modern industrial culture science, and traditional ecological knowledge together. 
But even back in the days of our first workshops, I remember um, some of the Aboriginal participants in those workshops who co-led those. Um, well, they really led them. We sat and learned, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talking about how much, say, ecologists would learn from Aboriginal elders. So, you know, it's just an ongoing worldwide, and particularly as we get to addressing climate change. Yeah. It's, it's vital that we pay attention to traditional yeah. knowledge. I'd also like to emphasize that our Indigenous mental health workshops were an example of white Australians learning from Indigenous knowledge, learning about mental health from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. For example, how important community and supportive relationships are to mental wellness. Uh, second, how important country and place are to mental wellness. Uh, third, how, how we always must consider mental wellness in a cultural, political, and historical context. And, and finally, how absent each of these three points are from European derived cultures, ways of teaching psychology. Now, admittedly, some learn these points more than others, but I remember some of our white students saying, why weren't we taught this before now? I think like for me, the lessons of the Reconciliation Action Plan initiative are, you know, one, the power of symbols, like we can't neglect them, they are important. And and your story, um, Paul, of the student that was that came because of that who shows, but also how they can be misleading, and they they in fact often precede action by quite a number of years, and sometimes can be a substitute for concrete action. So I think they, um, I encourage uh, students and staff to to really get behind the push for these symbolic agendas and plans, and then understand that this does not mean just because the school signs up that they will resource it or implement it. So the struggle continues. Um, what do you think the lesson mm -hmm. of the Reconciliation Action Plan, Paul? Um, the lesson of the Reconciliation Action Plan. I would say <laughs> uh, lessons plural and lessons. Um, <laughs> I can't say for from my perspective it was a particularly positive one. Um, you yeah. know, it's interesting hearing you say that you know, it's down the track that um, it can make a difference, and um, I suppose it, at the time it felt like it wasn't making any difference whatsoever, um, yeah. and I felt frustrated and um, you know I actually thought. Should should I have done it? You know, was it the right thing to do? I went ahead and did it, and I had um, support from First Nations people to do it. I spoke to um, Jackie Huggins and Michael Williams and others, and they thought it was a good idea. And I consulted. Yeah, they were shocked. Like and I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were excited. Um, but in a recent conversation with Michael Williams over coffee. Um, we were talking about whether it was a wise thing to do in retrospect because of the lack of action. So, um, and would we do it again if we had our time over? Um, and, um, you know, hearing what you're saying at the moment that, that, um, that you know, that there was, people were recognizing it and it was, it was a, perhaps a symbolic act, but, um, yeah, it did raise awareness. So yeah, um, I, I've lost, I, I lost my track. But <laughs> well, how I think we were talking about how you know it, from inside the institution, you can see how they're cynically using it as a branding exercise, and in their shell, hmm. they're spending money on reports or on initiatives that don't actually benefit and implement the agenda. But I kind of feel like as an as a longstanding activist in this space, what I've seen is that. First, you get them to take on a symbolic commitment and they're like, don't worry, it doesn't cost anything. And then a few years, mm. later, ratchet up the expectations and you're like, wait, you should, should implement this agenda. And they're like, oh my gosh, there's a KPI. And they start spending and they start putting in what was um, kind of just keeners because that's more mainstream. And 
you actually can't get to the mainstream without initiating at the fringe. Like you start at the margins of just reality. So what we start now will also be resisted and ignored for years. And I don't think it always happens that it's implemented. I definitely think that sometimes it can just remain a shallow fig leaf, especially when there's pushback. I mean, is that your experience, Valerie? I think that's true for activism and change generally, not yeah. just with others. Um, there is value in, in starting anything. And maybe the thought that eventually it might be years down the track that it actually has an effect is something that can sustain you through the frustration and hopelessness that sometimes comes of trying to take action and seeing it not go where you had idealized that it would go. Yeah, and not being recognized for it as well, not, not getting institutional rewards. I think it's very important that our listeners realize you will not get institutional rewards. <laughs> Unless you're in the generation where it becomes mainstream, where you can like um, wave a flag and, and get a, well, actually I say that, but I think we did win an award. We, we did get, we got a diversity and equity and inclusion award. I'm sorry. Paul, do you want to talk about that? That was for the um, workshop, I think. But so you get these kind of weird mixing signals mm. about where people will yeah. give you a small sum of money and a certificate, but they won't get behind it as an institution. What's your I'd, I'd have to say that um, I was act actively told, explicitly told, not to do the Aboriginal thing. Yes. I was sat down by a professor yes. in the department and said, you realise you're spending a lot of time on this and there's no academic outcomes. This is not yes. good for your career. You should stop it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, getting an awards nice um having a message that what you're doing is damaging your career and you should just stop it um wasn't nice um yeah. i was quite shocked by that quite honestly um and realized the battle that i had um that we all had yeah and maybe Can I ask because oh right, i'm sorry you go Can I ask, because um, because I'm not part of the School of Psychology anymore, what, you know, you've talked about land acknowledgements, uh, you know, acknowledging the traditional owners becoming part of courses now. Even that is largely symbolic. Um, I think we've what got is in place, what is in place in terms of supporting students? We've now? got more awesomeness than we've ever had, but it's largely dependent on the actions of people. Um, so, for example, we've got two Indigenous psychologists that are running a support group for Indigenous students, First Nations students, and one of those people was hired with the agenda of supporting and developing those kind of positions. But having said that, again, there's lots of uh, mixed messages and difficulties. So um, we could talk about that for another hour, right? But it's exciting to have actual money being put towards actual staff to deliver deliver resources, you know, from a paid place rather than on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. We also have a uh, an reconciliation action committee that's um, progressing the agenda. So it's not just Paul, a voice in the wilderness. Um, you know, I think whether that just is a moment that will then pass. Um, or whether it's a new wave of mainstreaming and institutionalizing, I'm not sure. But for example, as an academic, you know, you have to do service and serving on the Reconciliation Action Committee now counts as service. Whereas, you know, in the old days, I'm, I think it's fair to say, Paul, this would not have counted as a service obligation, right? I would keep it quiet. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that the relationship building um, going out in the community and um, meeting with uh, First Asia's organizations and which now, um, you know, in terms of academic outcomes, um, I've, I, I have so many requests to do research with in collaboration with the First Nations, these organizations that um, 
you know, it's attracting a lot of money and I'm getting lots of papers out of it. So uh, there's certainly the academic outcomes, but it took the relationship building in the early days to get to that point. Um, and um, so I would go off to a um, an organization, Family Support Service, First Nations Family Support Service, and I would um, sit with the staff and have coffee and chat and, um, and I would come back to the university and not tell anybody I'd done that because, um, you know, that's not, I wasn't really allowed to do that, you know, during yeah. working hours. So, yeah. um, but I saw it as re really important, but you know, I had to actively not tell, where were you this morning? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, I was just at a meeting <laughs> off, <laughs> off campus, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I tell the story, um, one of my mentors advised me to say when I went up for promotion, you know, um, look, if you just divide my CV and you just put all those messy applied papers over there and just, just look at these little experimental papers in mainstream journals, then you can see that I'm like you and I should be promoted. <laughs> 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 so funny, but it worked, it worked. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think these messages, it's important for our listeners to realize um, that you take risks sometimes if you're acting uh, in the margin phase. Uh, it gets mainstream, hopefully you don't need to take those risks. Um, we need to wrap up at least if we're gonna keep anywhere near our agenda of five minutes we've missed. But I wanna thank everyone for this great conversation, which I've really enjoyed. Thanks, Paul, thanks, Valerie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both.